Hey guys, Will Durst here with a few choice words about a group, a wonderful group, doing some great work, and they're called Ethics in Tech. Dot com. And I know what you're saying. Ethics in tech, wow, that sounds like an oxymoron. That's like saying vegetarian butcher or kosher pork tartare or Catholic condom supply house or George W. Bush think tank or Donald Trump guide to etiquette and manners. And you're right. But they're here to help. And they do with a smile. Every event that you go to will have a comedy component along with expert speakers and, and, and uh, panel discussions and, and audience particip community participation. So come on down, check out ethicsintech.com and you can see past events and you can read the blog and you can see about upcoming events. So ethicsintech.com, it's simple. And you might want to consider volunteering or you know throwing them a couple of bucks here and there uh, any and or all donations will be accepted and appreciated ethics in tech it doesn't have to be an oxymoron i'm gonna mute tonight for you for this evening um as you just saw the message from will durst we are a small nonprofit organization we don't have any corporate sponsors. So before we start the program tonight, I wanna to give a, a small shout out to our fans and followers and people that support these events. Uh, I'm not gonna mention all the names, but Kim, Janet, Oslam, Michael, Troy, Rahaf, Elaine, Marshall, Glenn, and many others. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be having this event. Um, so thank you, and hopefully you get an opportunity to uh, some of the big tech industries uh, and companies such as Amazon Web Services, Google, as, and others. Um, you might wonder why we're talking about this. As you know, um, folks like Jeff Bezos in the past six months during the pandemic were able to increase their wealth by over $70 billion, while 200,000 Americans died and millions more are unemployed. Companies um, received financial aid from the government and the people were left hanging with $1,200 one-time stimulus check which is really nothing. It's pathetic. So our destiny is controlled by the few oligarchs and the corporations that rule American capitalism. And it's them that I want to address. I don't think ultimately these people are bad people. I just think they're really misguided, that they are really misinformed, that they're really disconnected from empathy and sympathy towards their employees. towards the society they live in and the culture around them. And, uh, you know, I'll be talking specifically about my experience at Amazon for the first few minutes. And then we'll talk about, you might find in principles by I started at Amazon. I joined Amazon as a senior alliances manager for big data and analytics in June of 2015. I left Amazon in March of 2018. During that time period, the first year, I had four different bosses. I was responsible for managing the go-to-market strategy with some of the Amazon's biggest and largest strategic partner partners when it comes to data and analytics. There was a team, of course, that supported me. There were segment leads, there were product leads, there were people that um, supported these endeavors. But I was the one that was responsible for the end relationship with companies such as Splunk. After six months of my employment and my second boss at Amazon, <clears throat> I uh, want to share this doc. <clears throat> uh, 
Splunk names Amazon the partner of the year. Here's a picture of me receiving that award on behalf of AWS, uh, acknowledged by Splunk for my work, as well as acknowledging the team's effort at AWS that helped uh, Splunk and their go-to-market strategy. Um, this was, as you can tell, in March of 2016, six months into my employment at AWS. About three months later, uh, if you would play the video, this is Doug Merritt and Andy Jancy from CEO of Amazon talking about the relationship uh, between them and the importance of the relationship. So uh, let's play this bro fest for three minutes or so and kind of give you a sense of what I was doing uh, at AWS. To be here with Doug, uh, who's the CEO of Splunk. And Splunk is a very important partner and strategic partner for AWS. And we're excited about what we're doing together. Our partnership with Splunk is incredibly important for our customers. And one of the things I appreciate about Splunk is that they didn't try and defend the old guard model when the cloud was evolving. They saw what their customers wanted and they moved quickly to adopt the cloud and make that a reality. And, and their customer obsession is one of the many reasons we really enjoy partnering with them. Well, thank you, Andy. One of the things that we love about AWS and Amazon is how customer passionate and obsessed you guys are as well. It's been really interesting to watch how the cloud has evolved over the last several years. And there's been very rapid cloud adoption and yet there've been many naysayers who've argued the enterprise will never meaningfully use the cloud. And where we've evolved to is that the cloud has become the new normal. And companies of all sizes are deploying new applications by default to the cloud and moving as many of their existing applications as quickly as possible to the cloud. And the question has stopped becoming if and really become when and how fast and in what sequence these workloads are moving to the cloud. And in every imaginable vertical business segment, enterprises are using the cloud in a meaningful way, whether it's financial services or healthcare or manufacturing or consumer packaged goods or media or technology, they're all using the cloud. And they're choosing AWS for a few reasons. First, we have a lot more functionality than any other infrastructure provider by a large amount. Second, we have much more maturity in our platform because we've been operating for over 10 years. And third, and as importantly as any of them, we have a much more vibrant ecosystem of partners that are building around the AWS cloud. And Splunk is front and center there. It's really interesting if you look at how enterprises are migrating very large amounts of workloads to AWS. What they really love is they really love having that agility of AWS, but having the end-to-end -end visibility that Splunk provides them on top of AWS. Yeah, Splunk and AWS are, are working closely together in so many different ways, Andy. Our, our product teams work together on integrations that help customers ensure security and compliance of applications that run on AWS. Um, we help ensure applications uptime and performance on AWS, and we help them manage AWS costs in real time. We do this because you guys provide such great services from AWS, such as CloudTrail, AWS Config, AWS VPC flow logs, and AWS billing. Our go-to-market teams are working together to highlight how joint customers, such as Adobe, Autodesk, and Finra, gain end-to-end -end visibility across their entire AWS environment using Splunk. Autodesk is, is one of the examples, it's one of our joint customers, who's able to instrument their usage of the cloud by centralizing all of their data in Splunk and leveraging CloudTrail and Config. Now they can see super, super easily what's being created when and how quickly. So, um, I uh, was not just responsible for managing the Splunk relationship. As you saw, it's a big bro fest. They love each other. That video was shot a year to the date that I was hired to manage that relationship. I was also responsible for relationships with Tableau and other ISVs, and they also awarded Amazon the partner of the year. Basically, uh, after my fourth boss within the first year, they put a lot of pressure on me at AWS to a point that physically I uh, could not walk and had some back issues and I was hospitalized. Unfortunately, when I was hospitalized and I couldn't go to work, Amazon's management, instead of trying to work with me, what they did was go around my back. And what they did was, uh, here's a, uh, 
section of the book that I wrote about Amazon that I'm going to share. And uh, it's an email from a colleague of mine that sent out um, to me while I was on uh, medical leave. It says, D, I spent some time with J, Y, and M yesterday. Both mentioned challenges I have working with Vahid. Not sure where that is coming from. Just to be clear, I have no issues working with Vahid. I think there are areas where he can improve, but it's definitely true for me as well. Thanks. That was one of my colleagues that spoke out and actually sent me an email telling me that behind my back while I'm on a medical leave trying to get treatment, Amazon's executives are going behind my back to try to find something uh, in regards to my performance. When I came back to Amazon after my medical leave, I was told that I've been replaced, that my replacements were hired that day or that week, and there was no position for me within Amazon. Here's a company that hires over 100,000 people, supposedly, this has over 30,000 AWS partners, and they couldn't come up with five partners for me to manage. They made sure that I was unwelcomed in the organization. Um, that is how Amazon treats its employees as disposable commodities that they can get rid of anytime they want, and there's no repercussions. I would not take this matter to court because they have more attorneys, more legal counsel than anybody could imagine, and I wouldn't have a shot of winning it in court. But I want to plead my case to you as a viewer so you know my background. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Amazon leadership principles that Jeff Bezos uh, believes in. I um, I'm going to bring up Amazon's open hiring site. This is not a, uh, a PowerPoint by me. It starts off first and foremost with customer obsession. Leaders that start with the customer and work backwards. They work vigorously to earn and keep the customer trust. Although leaders pay attention to competitors, they obsess over customers. The question I always had about this leadership principle from Jeff is who is your customer? Is your customer the user of Alexa and Ring that is trusting their private data to you? Is it the customer that's shopping online and trusts their shopping history with you? Is it the customer that orders music online and has Alexa music playing that you know it's music histories? Or is it the defense industry, the NSA, the CIA, the organizations that monitor and undermine our civil, civil rights. Decide who the customer is, Jeff. You know, you can't have two masters. You need to decide if you're going to serve the side of the NSA and the CIA and organizations of that nature, or you're going to protect the data of consumers. So this whole customer obsession, without defining who the customer is, is really pointless. The reason I bring this up as a point is if you remember, Jeff Bezos has had his own phone hacked by the crown prince of Saudi Arabia after getting a WhatsApp text, um, which resulted in him getting a divorce. <coughs> now, Jeff, you associate with the MBSs of the world. Tomorrow is Khashoggi's two years anniversary of death. But the people in your phone book are the MBSs. These are the people you respond back to. So it tells a lot about the character of the man. Second, Jeff, why would a person like you, who's already been hacked, who already had his privacy violated, put on its board a former NSA chief Keith Alexander, who lied about mass surveillance and now joins the Amazon board. Why would you have somebody of this character on the board of a company that's supposed to be trusted with our data? Decide who your master is, Jeff. Are you beholden to the federal government with your Jedi contracts and your NSA contracts and your CIA? $900 million contracts? Or is it the average user and the consumer that you supposedly protect and care so much about? 
your loyalties are misguided. Let's talk about, um, yeah, this is a lot of stuff you guys can read on your own. Amazon says that they insist on the highest standards. Again, the question that I have is, what are these standards? Leaders have relentlessly high standards. Well, what are the standards? Is it the Chinese manufacturers that bring in goods into this country that are not repairable, that have to be disposed of, that are cheaply made? Is it the NSA that wants data on its US users as well as globally? So whose the standards are you following, Jeff? Whose the standards does Amazon care about? Define those standards. Let the organization know what that is and live by them. Finally, frugality. And I got a few things to say about this. I got a lot of stories to say about frugality. You know, Amazon is an organization that celebrates its holiday party in February. And that's not because we're celebrating um, Martin Luther King's Day or Valentine's Day, because that is because the company is so frugal that they'd rather get cheap um, facilities to be able to accommodate a Christmas party in, in February. Amazon frugality goes beyond that. It's um, paying poorly to the workers. What is $17 an hour for a man that just made $70 billion? I mean, a fraction of what you make, Jeff, could impact the lives of so many people. You could directly impact the lives of hundreds, thousands of workers and employees by increasing that money, but you won't just because you're cheap and too greedy. And that goes for the rest of the organization. You know, I don't care if I, you don't want to compensate me for the work I do at Amazon, but at least compensate your current employees fairly and give them something that they can live with during these difficult times. You know, the pandemic affected a lot of families and a lot more than just one person depends on that paycheck. So why not for once in your life, be known for generosity instead of being cheap? You know, that's what I would like to say to Jeff Bezos. Um, what else can I share with you? I, uh, you can read about some of these other um, uh, leadership principles, and I'll be happy to comment on each, but we don't have that much time. I want to talk about the one that they talk about, have backbone, disagree, and commit. Leaders are obligated to respectfully challenge decision when they disagree, even if doing so is uncomfortable or exhausting. Okay, leaders have conviction and are tenuous. They do not compromise for the sake of social cohesion. Once the decision is determined, they commit wholly. Well, tell me about your backbone. I bet Amazon and Jeff don't have a backbone. They're like a slug. Slugs don't have backbone. I know what it takes to have a backbone, and that means to stand up for something. Nothing that Jeff does, except for the mighty dollar, is that what he stands for. You know, at the end of the day, all the oligarchs and all the money they keep printing for themselves is to their benefits. It's, it's for the mighty dollar. That is their value system. What happens if we decide as humanity that we want to move away from this standard? that we're tired of the banks getting all the money they want from our politicians, that we're tired of our politicians supplying our corporations with endless cash while they leave the rest of us dry. You know, um, Amazon and Jeff Bezos are like river otters. They build a dam, but they build it with concrete and sewage and everything else, and they leave nothing for the people down the street. That's what I wanted to say about Amazon and um, its leadership principles briefly. Um, and uh, there is more that I can talk about, but we have a very short time during this presentation. And I want to bring out uh, our uh, interview with Boris Debich. Boris spent 15 years at Google. He's one of the longest time to be with a company. I got to admit, um, but I think you'll enjoy this interview. It was recorded earlier due to time difference between here and Croatia. He's over there teaching uh, at a university. And uh, here's Boris Debich.
So uh, Boris Debic, thank you so much for your time um, today in regards to speaking with us uh, and your experience in Silicon Valley and specifically at Google for the past 15 years. We're grateful to have you on our advisory board uh, since uh, you now moved to Croatia and are teaching full time at the University of Zagreb School of Economics. I wanted to discuss your experience in these 15 years working in Silicon Valley and specifically at Google. So what led you go to Google? How long, you know, what was the experience like there? And maybe you could share a little bit about that. So I spent uh, 24 years in Silicon Valley. I arrived uh, in um, Christmas 96 and I switched between a couple of startups. I was always uh, attracted to startups, small environments, collegial, you know, like working environment, uh, you know, like not a lot of bureaucracy. I spent, you know, like three and a half years at the United Nations, which is a huge organization. It is 120,000 people all around the world. And this was, you know, like quite refreshing, you know, like doing the startup uh, round, so to speak. So uh, one of the startups uh, was Epiphany, which was a very successful thing. I was 11th engineer there. And then eventually the company grew to 1,200 people. Uh, it went public. It had actually a secondary IPO from there. And it was you know, like full of very, very bright people, I have to say, uh, from Stanford, CMU, MIT, and uh, all of the other usual places. Uh, then in 2005, uh, I got an invitation to join Google's uh, release engineering team because uh, they were suddenly a public company and they had to start doing uh, certain things uh, the way the law requires you to do, like Sarbanes-Oxley Act and uh, other uh, uh, various things that's you know, like the regulators. Uh, uh, I, I believe that was introduced after the Enron debacle. So I went there and, you know, like it's, you know, like Google at that time was already like over 2000 people. I think the engineering department was around 1200 engineers, like a huge organization already in my view. And I said to myself, well, you know, I'll, I'll go there, you know, like I'll do a gig, you know, like spend a year, year and a half there and then move on, you know, like to my next startup adventure. However, you know, like as soon as I got into Google, you know, like you get really sucked by the brilliance of the people who work there. Some of them don't work anymore, but you know, like a lot of uh, very bright people still do work at Google, and I have you know like many friends there still. And uh, but you know, like many have also left Google in the meantime. So the growth uh, of Google in those 15 years went from something less than a billion uh, per year. I think it was in the hundreds of millions of revenue uh, to now you know, like in the billions that I, you know, I forgot how to count that high. And uh, you know, like the company grew from, you know, like I thought, you know, like I'll spend a little time and I spent 15 years. The company grew from you know, like a couple thousand uh, people to over 200,000 people today. All over the world. Now, when you call, so, when you mentioned those numbers of two hundred thousand people today that it has and its staff, I believe a lot of that is contractors. Were you ever a contractor at Google? Or were you always a full no? Employee? No, I was never. I I was once a contractor, but early on in my Silicon Valley career, and it was a very, very short period because they, you know, like the people, you know, like wanted to hire me immediately. But uh, Google, uh, yes, you're right. Uh, and that is one of the aspects uh, that the company changed uh, very much. So in the early days, uh, contract workers were uh, you know, like only a few very specific positions, which are very tedious work, you know, like machine learning and uh, machine intelligence was not that developed yet. But you had to rate uh, ads because, like, from very early on, the founders put a policy that no, we, we can't advertise, I don't know, guns and alcohol. And, you know, like, there's a couple of, of themes that, you know, like, we'll never get advertised on Google ads. And, and you know, like, and, and then there's the, you know, like, quality of the ads, you know, like, you don't want to, you know, like, put ads in the system which are actually scams or things like, you know, like of that sort of nature. 
So, so you know, like there were positions where we really needed contractors because it's a very tedious job. You're doing one and the same thing all day. It's you know, like it's not unlike flipping burgers, you know, like the whole day. And you know, like we knew that you know, like people wouldn't last. You know, like I mean, I think the average span for somebody working in that group was around six to eight months, and then they either moved into Google if you know, like if they found a good position and they were a match, or they just move on with their career. Uh, these days, however, I believe uh, it was maybe two or three years ago that we crossed a threshold where uh, over half of the uh, employees of the company are a contracting workforce. Some of it, you, you, you know, like, and, and there's a larger context around this, you know, like obviously some of it was driven by business needs. Some of it, you know, like may have been driven by, you know, like getting some extra profit and not having to take the responsibility for those people in the full some of it's you know like it's the way the whole of silicon valley operates where you know like i don't know the cooks or the janitors you know like they are subcontracted to other companies they're managed by other companies we used to have i mean you know like the first chef was charlie Ayers. he was an employee of the company and the early batch of chefs and you know like even cooks and lower staff were actually employees but that eventually changed. And, you know, like I don't, I was not part of this decision making chain in that process. I mean, it was obviously a function of the rapid growth and expansion of the company. Yep. Probably also some cost cutting. And, you know, like because, you know, like there were, you know, like quite a few chefs that there was a period of time where many of them actually left the company and they said, well, you know, this is not the culture we were employed into. And you know, like we're gonna find something else to do. Well, I mean, at lives. Amazon and elsewhere that I worked at, uh, consultants and contractors were treated as second-class citizens. You know, they wouldn't be invited to the Christmas party. They wouldn't be invited to the yeah. mixer. You don't see them socially. They're the ones that do the actual work. But a lot of them are. Yeah, behind I mean, them. look. So, so you know, like, let me try to put some more light on on this thing. So, you know, like, some of this in the way the current state of the world operates. And you know, like that, that's also questionable, right? I mean, we can question that, but you know, like the current state of how at least the West Coast operates, you know, like for some positions, contractors do make sense because you know, like if they're not part of your core business, like, you, you know, like then uh, you know, like it makes sense to you know, like have engineers and you know, like the people who are doing work on whatever is your core business that that is that that is somehow part of the core of the company, and then other things are either partnerships or you know like in some cases contractors. I guess one example that is sort of off the ball here. And it's probably because of the early culture is, you know, like Apple, I believe that I'm not sure because I don't really follow Apple that closely, but I believe that there are Apple stores, you know, like for the most part, those are Apple employees for the most part. I'm not sure about that. Maybe that has changed too. you know, like maybe their bottom line also has changed things, but I remember that. And then that's sort of, you know, like non-core business in a way, but then again, you know, like selling a product and having a good experience in the, in the purchase of the product. I mean, that is part of Apple's DNA. So the, the one thing that, let me, let me just conclude maybe with this. That the one thing that ties relatively closely to what you said about the rights that contractors have and the current state of Google is, uh, you know, like at one point in the recent couple of years, Google decided that they need a, you know, like a, an outside consultant to help them fight, uh, you know, like labor uh, organizing. Uh, you know, like I, I was never involved, you know, like in closely with any labor organizing. Although I did propose a sort of relatively radical thing 
you know, like around the time of the big walkout at Google when you know, like the, the big scandal and you know, like the five demands. And so I can talk about you know like that little detail later. But what I wanted to say is that you know like when I, I think that the the sort of the rise of contracting and the involvement of IRI consultants, there's probably some correlation in, in those two things. As you said, you know, like contractors, you know, like they can't speak up. They, you know, like can't say, hey, you know, like what we're doing is wrong. I mean, they're there to do their job, go home, and you know, like that's it. Some yeah. of the some of the some of the privileges that you mentioned that they don't have and or or they have, some of it is uh, sometimes it's due to legal constraints because you know like employees have different legal obligations to the company than contractors so you know like sometimes you can't get contractors into i don't know highly sensitive meetings that are you know, like responding to for example in google's case to the consent decree which was issued by the ftc you know like they're not privy to that they are not privy like to some of these conversations because of the legal status and you know like that that's some, somewhat understandable but changing the culture and preventing uh not i would not necessarily say you know like labor organizing because the labor organizing thing there were people who were doing that and pushing for some form of that but i can tell you that you know like within technology you know like there's a lot more people who no we're fine you know like let's just continue as it is so but they still you know like started changing the uh the mix and i don't think you know like having that many contractors is ultimately a super healthy thing i mean there are organizations that have lots of contractors nasa is one good example nasa is essentially you know, like just a management organization and pretty much almost all the work is done by either you know like contractors in the form of companies or people being contracted but that's a different situation it's a you know, like it's a government thing and they want to actually spread that money and have it go into the private sector not necessarily like be a competition to the private sector so you know like one can understand that from that context this is something completely different in the case of nasa i would say it's a privatization of space just as much as anything else by government funds where the government is paying for the technology and private companies benefit from it the universities work on it and at the end of the sure, day but, I mean, there's space treaties as well and there's lawyers at nasa who work you know, like on space space treaty related things so I don't think NASA will you know, like privatize space and you know like paint NASA on the moon or on Mars anytime soon. I think it would probably be Elon Musk before them. But you know, I mean, so there, there's you know, like there's different contexts. You have to understand what I'm trying to say is the contracting context is very complex. You have to you know, like take it all into account and understand what is you know, like business driven and it makes sense, and what you know like seems to be a way to undermine. Uh, you know, like people's participate, not people's, but you know, like employee participation in the shaping of the company. Okay. So Boris, um, just for the sake of time, I, our, our event is going to be short. We wanted to get sure. to the part of, you know, what ended up making you leave uh, Google after all these years. Um, what is it that you saw that was? Well, the time I, I guess I guess that the real question would be what made me stay the last five years. <laughs> You know, like, yeah, I mean, that the history of this is very long. I, I'll, I'll tell you, frankly, you know, like what made me stay is, you know, like there's still very many good people there. And, you know, like it's a, it's a, you know, like in some respects, it's a great working environment. I mean, there's a lot of collegialism still. There's a lot of very bright people from you can learn, which is really important. But, you know, like, at the end of the day, you know, like I started watching, you know, like one by one, you know, like either leave or being pushed out or, you know, like their projects being canceled because they are asking too many insider related questions. Like, you know, like the big example of that is you know, like the uh, Macmillan, you know, like who created the internal meme generator, which was sort of a vent for everybody 
to communicate the bad news really fast. And it was, you know, like a thorn in the side of many, many, you know, like VPs and higher execs, even, you know, like going to the top of the leadership. And eventually you know, he was, he was pushed away. There was, you know, like one period in time where HR uh, started dominating uh, grassroots efforts uh, started throughout the company. So there was a lot of groups which were started by you know, like engineers who had an interest in this or had an interest in that, and they formed a group. And you know, like eventually, you know, like after the group grew, and you know, like what became highly popular and you know, like interesting discussions were on the group, they would come and uh, they would co-opt uh, the group, literally co-opt the group. I, I know about this from you know, like at least two examples. One was uh, there was a, an early group, women engineers at Google, and it was you know like self-organized by you know like women engineers. Google did a lot of support for the Anita Borg Foundation, and you know, like we we gave out uh, a lot of grants to to women engineers, you know like for their PhDs and master degree studies. I was even on one of those uh, uh, committees that was uh, granting uh, these things. And so, so at one point, uh, you know, like the discussions became a bit too political for HR's uh, uh, tastes, if you will. And they went in and they just relieved all of the seniors in that group, the ones who created the group and, you know, like installed their own uh, people and from their own managed it according to what they said was HR rules. And the narrative was that, no, this group was too close. We need to widen this group and, you know, like have, you know, like a proper program and so forth. The same happened to, you know, like the early uh, founders of the Talks of Google program. Uh, it went, you know, like through the same exact path. And, you know, like there was, uh, I had discussions over that because I was part of that thing. And I went to HR and I said, well, look, I mean, you know, like the, 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 what, what they said there is that, you know, like, oh, you know, like we need to be accountable for the funds that go into the program because they were buying books and they were uh, paying for videotaping of the talks. And they said, no, we want, you know, like to make the group accountable. And I said, well, that's perfectly fine. That's great. You know, like, you, you know, like have a seat at, at our meeting and, you know, like whenever you know, like there's a project and there's funds associated with it, you know, like you can vet it, you can say yes, no, whatever. Uh, however, you know, like in those meetings, they brought in two, two other people from, you know, like the HR, so selected by HR, and they started destroying the group from within. You know, like they started arguing about pointless things. And, you know, like eventually, you know, like a big sort of friction was created between, you know, like the founders of the thing and HR. And, you know, like all of these old people were pushed out. So that was, that was the end of that story, which prompted me later on to uh, do something uh, for which, you know, like I may got, you know, like a black mark in someone's file. But at one point I said, well, look, I mean, HR is a really powerful organization uh, within Google. And, you know, like Google is a huge company. And, you know, like when you get a call from HR, you know, like that's no good. You know, either nobody wants to get a call from HR. It almost feels like, you know, like Nazi Germany and you know, like Gestapo is knocking at the door at some point. You know? And so I proposed, look, and, and, you know, like a lot of complaints went against, against HR. Like meme gen was full of complaints about how they conduct their business, what their priorities are, you know, like this kind the sex scandals and, you know, like how they could allow, you know, like those things to, to pan out as they did pan out. And in one of my posts, I said, well, you know, like, I mean, perhaps the solution is, you know, like at one point we split a lot of groups internally at Google and we created so-called product areas. So ads is a product area and maps is a product area and Android is a product area. And I, I just suggested you know, like, you know what, maybe, you know, like HR should be actually split 
and you know like reports to each of the product areas with the idea being that you know like look you have the same organization it still has the same goal as you know like hr has today but you have competition between various groups and you know like different ideas of how to address issues and different ideas of you know like who gets to work in the group and how they conduct themselves i bet you you know like in the current constellation of hr that did not you know, like get me, you know, like uh, extra points. I mean, it never touched my performance reviews or anything. I was always, you know, like exceeding expectations and all that. But I can certainly tell you in our organization of this size and this complexity, that does not make you friends. So, so um, my last question, Boris, is uh, what you instill in your students uh, from your experience in Google? What is it that uh, you want them to take away from uh, from what you learned for these 15 years? So I just, you know, I had my first uh, class for today's, for this semester. And I can tell you, you know, like, and, and I'm, I'm teaching uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, I can tell you, and I, you know, like I, I have a syllabus online and the students look at the syllabus and all that. And, you know, like I, I, I told them, okay, let's have a little bit of a free discussion because we can still shape, you know, like the course and everything else. What are you guys interested in? And, you know, like roughly 50% of the questions went, you know, like into the area of ethics, privacy, uh, data collection, and things of that sort. And I, 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 I do have that in my program. It comes uh, in the third third of the program when you know, like I build a lot of muscle with them where they you know, like learn what the techniques are, where they are used, what is it that we do with our artificial intelligence in today's business environment, how different companies use this. And then once I give them this basic knowledge so that they understand what is this, how, how this is useful and how it operates, then we're gonna probe you know, like the ethical and the privacy and all of the other questions and the security questions that are on many people's minds. So it's going to be interesting. Boris, uh, I would like to ask you to come back for future discussions with us. That's a big, Google is a big topic and same as Silicon Valley. We can still cover it all in a 15 or 20 minute call, but we can do this uh, frequently and we have programs on a regular basis and would love to see you again um, contribute content to ethics and tech we uh, will use this video on october 1st and it'll be available on our site and youtube and what have you right after um we publish it on october 1st um i'll be more than happy to join you in, like in future events Vahid. i really think what you guys are doing is really important you know like this is not just an industry this is a huge industry which will only grow in the future you know, like it, IT is the sector, you know, like that will, you know, like continue growing. And so, you know, like it will permeate every aspect of our lives. And, you know, like there's a lot of open questions out there that's, you know, like I hope to contribute with my uh, little bit of wisdom from working in Silicon Valley and in big tech. So. Oh, no, you're, you're a great contributor. Thank you so much, Boris. Thank you for your time. Many thanks to Boris Debich. Um, Boris is an advisor to ethics and tech, and we're lucky to have him. One of the things that I love about ethics and tech is the diversity of our advisors and um, where they come from. And uh, I'm also excited about our next speaker, Mr. Bob Chandra. Bob has worked in product marketing at companies such as Amazon, Walmart e-commerce, Twitter. So um, he knows big tech. He's been in it. And uh, not only that, Bob is a dear friend. I've known him for 20 plus years. When I met him, he was one of the youngest CEOs and always an overachiever. So it's great to have you, Bob. Uh, and we're going to share a video on uh, his presentation now. Um, so uh, please take a moment and watch. Today, I want to talk about a problem in tech that's both pervasive and ignored. That's discrimination against Asian Americans in the workplace, particularly the idea that they're not perceived as leaders. This is sometimes called the bamboo ceiling or the Asian glass ceiling. I'll also talk about people who are racial advocates in Silicon Valley 
often contribute to the problem by ignoring it or claiming that it's not a problem. And then finally, I'll list a few solutions uh, for people who are interested in combating the problem, uh, the problem of anti-Asian racism can do so. Let's start with who is Asian? The term Asian encompasses South Asians, such as people from India, East Asians, people from China, Japan, Korea, and Southeast Asian from countries such as Indonesia or Vietnam. As you can see, being Asian spans different races and different cultures. But one thing Asian Americans have in common, despite which kind of Asian they are, is that they're stereotyped uh, as worker bees, essentially, capable of doing low-level work at the individual contributor level, but they're not seen as management material. Asians, as a group, are the least promoted of any other racial group. Uh, graduates from Harvard and Stanford produced a study called Illusions of Success, uh, and they looked at EEOC data from 2017. Uh, EEOC is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And they found that Asians were the least likely to be promoted to management of any race. Uh, less likely than whites, but also less likely than Hispanics and blacks. The same researchers looked at national EEOC data and they found that what they saw in the Bay Area was replicated across the nation, that Asians, again, were the least likely of any race to be promoted uh, into management uh, and also into senior management positions. What I want to show you here is the ratio of workers to managers uh, at Bay Area manufacturing and information companies. Uh, this chart goes through uh, the ratio of workers to executives. And let's define terms. Uh, here it shows professional versus executive. When they say professional, what they mean are workers or employees. And when they say executives, they're referring to up to two levels removed from the CEO. So the, the senior most managers at a company. What you can see in the top left is that whites have a plus 25% compared to the average uh, in terms of holding executive positions uh, versus uh, worker positions. Asians have a negative 22%. This compares unfavorably not just to whites, but also Hispanics and blacks. Uh, if we look at Hispanics, the ratio is, uh, the number is negative 1.3%. And for blacks, it's negative 0.8%. So again, the number for Asians is negative 22%. So the problem of being stereotyped and pigeonholed as individual contributors acutely affects Asians more so than any other race. Let me shift gears from data to anecdotes. Uh, I'm South Asian myself, uh, and I have friends who are Asian, who work in the tech sector. And here are some things I've heard, that they feel like they're reduced to a stereotype, uh, that they're thought of like a robot or like a workhorse, essentially someone who will do the work without complaining. Uh, but they're not viewed holistically as a full person with feelings, with ambition. And consequently, they're treated in that way. Uh, they're given things to do, uh, but management doesn't see a, a management path for them. Along the same lines are assumptions that management has of Asians in the workplace. Uh, again, from my peers or from friends who are Asian, these are the things I've heard most common. One, not a leader, lacks soft skills, uh, doesn't think strategically. 
What I find interesting about this is those people who said these things have some of the best soft skills uh, I've seen, uh, regardless of race. And from casual discussions that I've had with them, think strategically about the tech industry. And yet somehow management doesn't see that. One of the things I want to mention is prescriptive stereotypes. What those are, uh, are essentially an individual prescribing how a person should act or how they must act. So, for example, if you see Asians as not thinking creatively, if there's, let's say, an Indian person on the team, you think that they're good at, let's say, math or writing code. If there's an opportunity for them to participate in, let's say, some new business that requires creativity, you might not even solicit their opinion because you don't think they're, they're good at that necessarily. So that forces that person into a box where they're not able to show their skills because you've determined ahead of time that they don't have that skill set. Or if there's an Asian woman on the team and someone has to work cross-functionally with different parts of the organization, that's often a stepping stone to management. Uh, but if you don't see that person as someone who can lead, uh, such an initiative, uh, you might never ask her. And that's a way in which people's stereotypes essentially confine Asians uh, to a certain way of being and don't explore characteristics that would lend themselves to management. So let's talk about some of the stumbling blocks to breaking the bamboo ceiling. The first hurdle is the model minority fallacy. In this fallacy, people assume Asians are doing well, uh, they don't need help. Uh, the reality is it doesn't matter how much education or how much income you have, that doesn't spare you from racism. Jewish Americans are a good example. As a group, they economically fare well, but that doesn't protect them from anti-Semitism. And so that's a serious concern regardless uh, of the, let's say, the average income of that group. The same is true with Asian Americans and the bamboo ceiling. Uh, the bamboo ceiling prevents people from self-actualizing, from going as far as their abilities take them because of racism. And so the model minority fallacy uh, is, holds Asian progress back because people have these uh, errant notions. The second is apex fallacy. So you might be familiar with some Asian CEOs such as Sundar Pichai of Google or Jensen Huang of NVIDIA. The apex fallacy basically means you evaluate a group, in this case Asian Americans, based on the performance of the best or most successful group members. As we saw earlier in the presentation, a lot of Asians are struggling uh, at the bottom of the organization uh, and they're the least likely to be promoted. So these few examples shouldn't overshadow the experience of many Asian Americans. The third hurdle is comparing, which is to say that group X is doing worse than group Y and therefore we shouldn't concern ourselves about group Y. Martin Luther King said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The idea is that we all have a stake in one another's equality. So just because an organization fights for racial justice uh, and fair treatment for black Americans or for women in the workplace, doesn't mean that we should exclude Asians uh, from the pursuit of equality, and nor should we practice racism uh, against Asians, Asians uh, and normalize it. Recently, a Silicon Valley company released a 19-page diversity report. In it, they said, quote, if you do not intentionally include, you will unintentionally exclude. The irony is that the report talked about Asi African Americans, Hispanics, and Native Americans, but excluded Asian Americans. This is one of the challenges today, is that human resources and diversity officers, the very people who are tasked to solve problems of racial fairness, often through conscious or unconscious bias, 
exclude Asian Americans from their efforts. This is an area that needs to be addressed. So we've talked about the problem. What's the answer? I've outlined two solutions to address anti-Asian bias in the workplace. The first is to include Asians uh, in tech companies' diversity plans. As we just saw, tech companies often exclude Asians from those plans. So one thing that might be simple to do is if you see a tech company's diversity plan or them publishing their numbers, but excluding Asians from that, is to email HR or email the diversity officer and encourage them to include Asians uh, in those efforts. The second is incorporate implicit bias training for employees. Different companies already have implicit bias training, for example, Google and Starbucks, but they too omit Asians uh, from that training. Let me step back. Implicit bias is basically subconscious or unconscious bias. So the kinds of stereotypes we form about different kinds of people, sometimes not even being consciously aware we're doing it. Implicit bias training seeks to break those connections uh, in our minds so that we treat people fairly. Starbucks recently had implicit bias training for all of its employees, uh, and it addressed discrimination against Blacks and Hispanics, uh, but not Asians. So whatever Starbucks employees, whatever their biases were before the training, they had those same biases after the training uh, because no effort uh, was undertaken to address uh, Asian stereotypes. The Asian American community welcomes and needs allies. So if you're able to take action on either of these two solutions, uh, that would be very much welcome and appreciated. We can't talk about ethics in tech without talking about racial fairness. People naturally want to go as far as their abilities take them. Uh, but unfortunately, biases and stereotypes get in the way. People have no control over their skin tone, the shape of their eyes, or facial features. And ultimately, companies are better off when they promote based on merit rather than superficial qualities. I also want to close by saying this is less about management positions than it is the pain and humiliation people feel when they're rejected or they're not promoted because they don't look the part. The solutions that I mentioned, hopefully there are opportunities uh, ahead that people can act on those and put a dent in the bamboo ceiling to reform tech and make it a place where everyone is treated fairly. Thank you so much, Bob, for that presentation. You know, regardless of where we work, if it's Amazon or Google or the next startup, we all expect a certain level, uh, level of dignity and respect in our workplace. And uh, regardless if we're Asians, Middle Easterns, or another minority that works in the tech sector, either as employee or as contractor, we deserve that respect and dignity. It's not all about the paycheck. It's not all about the money you earn in this business. I would like to introduce uh, Reverend Martin Todd Allen, the Associate Minister at the Church of Fellowship of All People, an interfaith interreligious, uh, multicultural uh, organization, religious organization. And uh, we always bring comedians, but we also bring in men of cloth to give us a few good words. Um, so Reverend Allen, why don't you take it away and tell us what concerns you? In 2003, I was a captain in the U.S. Army serving as a chaplain. I don't think there's ever been a time in my life before or since when I had so much respect and dignity. But I came to a point of crisis when I realized that I was part of the U.S. military. I guess I was a slow learner. But I realized that I could no longer participate in the war against Iraq. And so I resigned my position as chaplain. I lost my commission as captain. And I left the Army. And I was put in a a psych ward where they figured out what to do with me. It wasn't a padded wall, but it was, it was a psych ward. 
as they figured out where to put me. And during that time, there was a song by Jackson Brown that gave me such comfort because it reminded me that I was in good company in standing against war, in standing against killing, and in standing against imperialism around the world. So I'd like tonight to sing that song, but today that song has a special meaning because I'm targeting this not just to imperial killing and drones around the world, but specifically to a group of people known as the Proud Boys that our president endorses and supports. This song is for them because the words had relevance in 2003 and they have relevance today. It begins with a prayer. God is great, God is good. He rules your neighborhood, though it's generally understood. Not quite the way you would. You try to take the slack, stay awake and watch his back. But something happens every now and then. Someone breaks into the promised land. Ah, oh, boys, boys, this world is not your toy. This world is long on hunger. This world is short on joy. A-E-I-O, you speak as if you know what's good for everyone, what's good in what you've done. What's good about a world in which war rages at fever pitch and people die for the little things, a little corn, a little beans. Ah, oh, boys, boys, this world is not your toy. This world is, this world is, this world is long on hunger. This world is short on joy. You measure peace with guns, progress with megatons. Who's left when the war is won? Soldier of misfortune, soldier of an angry call, soldier of a foreign soil. I'm not here to fight your wars. I know what you're fighting for. Oh, boys, boys, this world is not your toy. This world is long on hunger. This world is short on joy. Long on hunger, short on joy. How much longer you gonna keep the world hungry and poor? How long? Wow, thank you so much, Reverend Allen. <laughs> That's a beautiful voice you have, and what a beautiful poem, and the timing is so perfect right now. Uh, so uh, thank you for sharing that. It's greatly appreciated. It's mighty kind of you. It's from the heart, and we felt it, and uh, I think everybody felt it, and uh, we're grateful for it. So uh, with many thanks for your participation tonight and for the church for taking part in all our events in the past and uh, having either yourself or Dr. Blake or others present uh, to our audience. We're blessed by it. Um, at this point, I want to introduce my good friend, uh, Debbie Durst, an advisor to ethics. Ethics and Tech. Her husband, Wilders, was an amazing political com comment, uh, comedian, uh, a dear friend. Um, so first and foremost, uh, Debbie, tell us how our dear friend Will is doing and uh, how you are. And we're looking forward to some comedy. Hey, Vahid, thanks so much. Um, I... I got good stuff, nothing but good stuff to report about Will. He is both in occupational therapy and physical therapy. And for those of you who don't know, occupational therapy is your upper body. 
because he the stroke uh, affected the left side of his body. So we need to get that left arm moving again. And there's movement happening. Uh, he can move his fingers and his wrist. And today he kind of moved his arm in, in therapy, in this therapy session. And that was like thrilling, thrilling to see. Uh, physical therapy is your lower body. So we're working on that. He goes three times a week, uh, two physical therapy, one occupational therapy. And he gets a workout. And he is very hopeful for the future. His spirits are really good. He said to say hello to everybody tonight. He, I gave him the, uh, the link for YouTube. Hopefully, hopefully he's watching right now on his little iPad in his room. And um, he sends everyone his love. What a great show you put together tonight, Vahid. And I am so happy and proud to be presenting the comedians that we have tonight. They're super. They're fun. I've known them forever. Uh, your, your first comedian, ladies and gentlemen, is a square peg in a round hole. He's that kind of guy. He was raised in the Midwest, so he actually has manners. He's <laughs> lived in San Francisco for, I would say, over 20 years. So naturally, he thinks he's better than you. He does two great things. He tells stories and he loves to talk to a crowd. He's here to talk to you tonight. He's performed at every single major comedy club that's in the country, even out of the country. <laughs> and he's a regular, the Bay Area comedy scene. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor. And I hope you would love, love him like I do. Please welcome Mr. Joe Close. <laughs> thank you very much, Debbie. Uh, and thank you for the bell, Maureen. That was nice. Um, well, welcome. And a uh, special shout out to you, Will, if you're watching. Hello. <laughs> Hope you're doing great. I know you are. And uh, I'm dying to hear all of your thoughts about all the craziness that's going on. Um, I'm coming to you, yeah, live from San Francisco in between, I don't know, the fire Armageddon and our impending dem democratic collapse. So, you know, it's a nice place to be. Uh, you know, with all this lockdown, though, the weird thing is, is I've actually gotten to know my neighbors in the building more because everybody will go outside uh, to get a breath of air, um, you know, uh, right on the stairs there. And the other morning I'm standing out there and uh, there's a guy out there just going on and on and on about you can't vote for Biden. You can't vote for Biden. Can you imagine what it would be like having an old, out of touch white guy say crazy <laughs> stuff all the time? Like, yeah, what would that be like? I can't imagine what it would be like to have a crazy, out of touch white guy as president. What would that be like? Um, and I should also tell you that um, you can listen to me and trust me because I have a mohawk, which is not usually something people would associate with that, but I lost a bet. So that should tell you, <laughs> that's actually what happened. And it should tell you that um, I'm a man of my word, but I still do stupid stuff. That's what it should tell you. When I went to the coffee, stop, the, the coffee place this morning, the uh, millennial behind the counter was like, what are you now, like a middle-aged Asaurus? That's nice, that's very hurtful, thank you, I appreciate it. No, uh, no Venmo tip you now, my friend. Um, it's all done on tech now, isn't it? You know, that's that's the thing that's really fascinating and interesting. And I think people are also just looking for the old style of, of comfort. Like another guy in the building, he lives in a tiny, tiny studio apartment. And right before we all got locked down, he got a great Dane dog, a great Dane dog. And I'm like, what's that like living with the dog now? And he's like, it's like having furniture that shits. Wow. OK, that's. That's a vivid description. I never thought in my life I would have to take my ottoman out before I go to bed, but I guess that's how, how it has to be now. Uh, I've also done very useful things with my time, as I'm sure we're all looking for useful things to do with our time. Like I rewatched every episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, and I rewatched it over Zoom with friends, and uh, I think I learned a lot about the people that are, I call friends, and they learned a lot about me. One night, we're watching an episode that has Klingons, and I'm in be honest with you i hate the klingons i think they're just boring one-dimensional characters everything is like you have no honor we must fight it's just boring right and so i said out loud oh i hate the klingons and a woman goes oh my god you're a racist i'm like uh 
they're not real. And her honest to God <laughs> reply was, that's how Hitler started. Like, oh my God, really? Really? Is cancel culture going to show up for me in 10 years and go, he hates Klingons? Maybe, maybe. We can't even get along with the people we call aliens here. So I think when they come, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and yeah, it is really smoky out here again today. Um, I, you know, the best that you can hope for is it, it wasn't another, another gender reveal party gone wrong. Um, I, I, that still blows me away. Like, if you decide in the middle of the hottest month in a record setting drought to go into a national forest and light off a pyrotechnic device to tell everyone the sex of your child, maybe you shouldn't be a parent. Maybe you just don't have critical thinking skills to raise a child. And that child, he's screwed for the rest of his life. When that kid turns 18, ma, pa, I wanna go to college. Well, we blew the college fund because we had to pay a fine because daddy here had to tell his friends you were a boy. <laughs> you know, let's, let's be real about it. Let the kid do the same thing and tell his parents what his sex is, you know, after his first freshman year in college. That's the way to do it. Um, here's the other thing that I had totally fallen in love with and, and enjoyed during all of this, this stuff. Uh, I, I've gotten more technologically savvy in some ways. So I'm gonna present to you um, sort of my at-home version of something like a daily show. Because uh, we can do that now, man. Um, boom, this is a lake in Texas where uh, there was a Trump voter parade going on and four of the boats capsized. You can laugh at that, it's okay, nobody died, right? And I like to think that the boats ran into Hillary's emails. Like that's where they've been the whole time. Uh, and one of the survivors said, the boat went down and then I was overtaken by a blue wave. Oh, the irony. Let's hope that that's what actually happens. Um, there's also just so many people going on and on and on about masks and they don't want to wear a mask. I'm going to warn you, this photo might be a little difficult to look at, but this is an actual photo of a man protesting having to wear masks in public. Ready for this? Boom. There he is. And if you look closely at this guy, I think what he's really protesting is having to wear another piece of fabric on his body that doesn't fit. It's not a fat joke. I'm just saying he has not mastered shirts yet. So I'm sure he's like, another piece of cloth? I can't handle that. And here's the other thing too, that just, this is how strong his hatred is. Look at that flag. It is clean, it is pressed, it is the most pristine thing about that guy. Because clearly he has not figured out clothes yet, but having a flag of hate, that he's got nailed. Um, also, you gotta love these guys. They're always, you can't, you're never gonna talk about 2020 without talking about these two. Boom, there they are, St. Louis couple. And here's the thing I'm, I've been curious about since I saw this. What level of Fox instilled hatred do you have that when you think a crowd is coming to kill you, that you run out of the house and you're like, oh my God, should we put our shoes on? No, get the guns. Look at them, they don't have shoes on, okay? They live in a house where they had easier access to guns than they did their shoes. And I don't know, why would you think that the crowd is finally coming for you? Maybe it's because you live in this lay Miz backdrop that you call a house. Maybe that's why you thought the crowd was finally coming for you. Um, and then, of course, we're going to be talking about this guy forever. Uh, Trump, man, oh, man, oh, man. Like, to me, things were really scary and hopefully not a, a little window into what's going to happen on election night. But do you remember the night that protesters were outside the White House and they were chanting and the Secret Service actually took them downstairs to the secret bunker, right? Well, here's what the White House did outside. Boom. Look at that. They turned all the lights off like it was Halloween and they ran out of candy. You gotta love that. People are outside like, we want peace and we want justice. Oh, we're out of that. What should we do? Turn the lights out. Turn the, maybe they'll go next door. Like, if we're to believe Trump that he didn't go into the bunker, that means what? He sat in a completely dark White House alone and listened to people chant? That's healthy behavior. And so how does he make up for it the next day? He gasses the peaceful protesters so he can go stand in front of a church holding 
a Bible. And look at that. That is not a man who is familiar with picking up a book. That is not how a normal person holds a book. Look at how he's looking at that. And honestly, he is reading that the same way I read labels on breakfast cereals at Whole Foods, all right? And he's probably thinking the same thing I'm thinking about the Bible and the cereal. I am not swallowing that. No way, man. But that is not a normal human way to hold a book. He's really looking at that going, I've been calling these door stops for as long as I can remember. That's really what he's probably thinking. And the other big thing about 2020, I mean, there's been so much and there's going to continue to be so much. But this was also the year that America was like, okay, you know what? It's been cute, but you need to take down all the Civil War statues. It's weird. And there's tons of people in the South that are like, but that's how we learn about history. And every time I hear them say that, I just think your mind is just going to explode when you learn about books. Oh, my God. And like, what are you supposed to learn from from a statue anyway? Like everyone was covered in shit and had a sword. That's all I see in those statues. That That is it, man. I think every Confederate statue should come down except one. I think this one should stay up because it is hilarious to me. This is an actual statue on private property in Tennessee. Ready for this? Kaboom! Look at that. That is not a person who has seen a human face or a horse's face, uh, but you can tell it's made in the South because look, they got the gun perfect, which of course they did. I don't know if you know who that is. I don't know that anybody would, but that is a, a statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest. He was the founder of the KKK. And looking at that, it actually makes sense to me why they started wearing hoods. Because if that's really what his face looked like, everybody else must have just been like, Nathan, Nathan, we really appreciate the fact that you're terrifying people that are different and not as powerful as us in society. But man, you got to cover that up. All right. You're just making us look bad. You look like an upset gumball machine. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my opinion from San Francisco. Uh, long live democracy. I hope we all feel better. Wear a mask, listen to scientists, and that's it for me. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Joe. That was that was lovely. It was <laughs> I really liked that statue. <laughs> you know what? I, I think I, I might have to have something like that just in the yard, just to attract all the pigeons. Um, and you look good. You look great. You look fabulous. He does. Uh, I love them. Not many people can pull off a mohawk, but you, you make it look good. Um, your next comedian, ladies and gentlemen, is not only a stand-up comic, but mm -hmm. she's also, she's a talk show host as mm -hmm. well. She's yeah. performed on Broadway yes. with Rosie O'Donnell, and she has opened for such notables as Stephen Wright, Joy Behar, Gladys Knight, and maybe some pips in the background. Her podcast, Hangin' with Langen, can be heard wherever you get podcasts, which is pretty much anywhere in the world. Got to give it a listen. She's hysterical. She's funny. She's here right now for you, ladies and gentlemen, my pal, Maureen Langen. Oh, hear ye, hear ye. Hello, everyone. Making it a little festive. How is everyone? You're a good looking group of people. I mean, overall, one or two in a box are freaking me out. But overall, you look good. Um, first of all, I, a big shout out to Will Durst. Will, I hope you're watching. Get well. Everybody loves you. Your name is constantly Will Durst. Will Durst. I'm sick of it. Stop your attention seeking behavior already. Let's go. Um, and I just want to also. Um, so thank you to that reverend. I, I really liked his message. I thought it was really beautiful. Uh, he set a beautiful tone. We need it right now. And only in America could you be considered the, the one off balance for wanting to do the right thing, you know? Uh, he's got it right. So I applaud you. Um, that the other night, anybody, anybody relapse? Anybody? I couldn't, that debate, my, oh my God. Let me tell you something. I don't have a drinking problem and I now need a sponsor. It was so insane. Anyway, they say God has a plan. Let's just hope he gets a better party planner. That's what I'm looking for. So we are here uh, to, uh, there's tech people. There's people who make a lot of money even during COVID. There are people out there uh, watching this and, and I hate you. I mean, it, it's not you, it's what you represent, which is technology. And see, when I see you, I see Zoom and I see Facebook and I see stream keys. 
and I see my head exploding. This is what I don't get. You know, we're all working from home now. So apparently I needed a stream key. I don't know why, but Zoom and Facebook were forcing me to get one. So I Google because I was a journalist and that's what I do. And this is what it said, I swear. And you're looking at me, I know, like you're judging me, I don't care, but this is what it said. Stream key can only be used for a single live stream, including preview of your stream. You need a new stream key to resume your stream every time you cancel or preview a stream. Like that is mental torture. So like I call my friends and I'm like, and they're like, oh, well, Maureen, you know, you got, well, how's your router or your modem? Do you have an adapter, like a, a thumb drive? Is your hard drive, your external drive? I'm going to drive a nail into my head. That's what I'm going to do. And then they're like, there's uh, Ethernet. And we know this. And I know what all these things are for overall, but I don't know how you make them all happen. There's Ethernet and extenders and uploads, downloads. There's 5G and there's USB and now there's mesh. I need mesh. I thought that was like for, you know, to make women's vaginas be okay, like prolapse, but now it's a tech thing. So then people are like, well, erase your history. I'm like, years of therapy, I haven't been able to do that. And then they're like, well, <laughs> enable your cookies. I'm like, now you're talking, now you're talking. But then I go on in frustration, I type on Facebook, somebody help me, I'm going to jump off a bridge. And I, my right hand to God, bam, Facebook instant messages me, the hotline number for the suicide prevention hotline. I'm like, are you kidding? They think I'm insane when all I need is a stream key and an effing hug. That's all I need. That's all I need. All right. So this virus has been, um, it's just been interesting. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, um, one of the first things I closed down early on uh, were the golf courses. I don't know if you know, that's true. And uh, had they only done this sooner, my marriage might've lasted. Boom, boom. All right. So, um, <laughs> we're having, come on, you guys. This is such a unique, different way to connect and come together. And we're doing the best we can. We had a little nice reverend music. We had Joe with his effing mohawk. And I love his like freaking edge. And I love the anchor that, that we can collectively put into, okay, whatever. Put it in a bubble, blow it away. Here's the deal. People say to me, um, hey, Maureen, are you flying these days? I said, off the handle, just off the handle. Um, Hey, Maureen, because I got my hair cut. Look at that. So, hey, Maureen, uh, why don't you let your hair go gray? I said, for the same reason, I don't let my teeth rot. <laughs> um, all right. So I don't miss flying. I don't miss it. And uh, because the last time I was, how edgy can I be? I don't, I'm not cursing. I'm not really dirty. I can use a, 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 a word, right? Give me a, okay, thank you. Rahid, Rahid. It doesn't matter. You could tell me how I say your name. Come on. I got to hear you. We're, we're together. You can speak freely. You can tell me. Vahid. Vahid. Huh? Vahid. Vahid. So listen, Vahid. Um, V-A-H-I-D. <laughs> I see the spelling, but I don't know how to say it. All right. So um, I was on the airplane, and this woman behind me gets up. This is the last time I flew, before the virus. She gets up, and she starts spritzing cinnamon. Like she's spritzing cinnamon. And then you know, you're in a cabin with the cinnamon. I turn around like, lady, what are you doing? She goes, well, it's natural. I see, so is my vagina, but I'm not shoving it in your face. <laughs> come on, baby. Come, come on, on, buddy. Right? Come on. Woo! All right. So, um, I don't know. It's just fun, right? So, um, oh, yeah. Now, being on the road, it, you know, I love it. I, I miss being on the road with comics. But, you know, I had a car accident. I'm all right. I don't want anybody to worry about me. But, um this young guy stoned out of his mind on his cell phone, music blaring, barrels into the back of my car. He gets out of the car and he comes up to me. He's like, dude, I don't know what happened, dude. He's calling me dude, are you getting it? Dude, I don't know what, ha I go, what happened is your mother forgot her birth control in 1998. That's what happened, dude. Maureen, that was edgy and angry. I know, and funny. So, um, yeah, like these people, these people. Okay, there's a guy who was a comic and he's now a motivational speaker. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. This guy's going to make you want to jump off a bridge. Um, don't hear from him in 15 years. You know, you just work the circuit together. He uh, sees me and posts something like, you know, whatever. Uh, like, if you don't wear a mask and there's a vaccine and you want the vaccine, you have to go last in line. That's all. You just have to go last. That's all I'm saying. If you want it, you may not want it. So he kamikazes into my world, haven't seen him 15 years, into my Facebook page, my safe space, not a safe space. But, um, and he's like, you know, Maureen, uh, these masks, uh, 
you don't need them. Immune system, maybe if you paid more attention in eighth grade science class, and I'm like, well, maybe if you didn't drop out of school and got beyond that, you would know more. So there's a little bit of anger out there. But this guy in the supermarket said to me, uh, Costco, never went to Costco in my life. Now I'm buying five. I said to the woman when I got there who worked there, I said, miss, Costco lady, that place is overwhelming. I said, Costco lady, where is um, the toilet paper? She said, what kind? I said, the kind you use to wipe your ass. Like what kind, I don't understand what kind, what are you talking about? Um, I mean, I'm sure in Ireland, my mother used newspaper, but I think we've emerged, we've, you know, so this guy behind me in the store says to me, he has his mask on. He goes, you know what? If the Democrats get elected, it's going to be like this every day. I go, oh, it is like this every day. <laughs> Good one, Maureen. Okay, so um, <laughs> just being, but it's true. All of this is true. And um, I know, I don't know how many guys or gals are out there, but I asked this question. I had to, um, this is an aside. Um, I'm doing some genealogy and I called the uh, Bureau of Vital Statistics in Manhattan and I said, I am looking for a death certificate. And the guy said, is it for you? <laughs> I said, yeah, I like to plan ahead. My soul's dead. Does that count? But, um, you know, I like isolating. I have friends, you know, because I'm post-period pre-death and I have a lot of friends at that age. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. So um, post-period pre-death. So I'm at that age where, I hate that, you're at that age, but I am where women become cougars. I don't want to be a cougar. I have no desire. But my friend Carol says, but you know, Maureen, um, dating a 30-year-old makes me feel so young. I'm like, okay, but it makes you look so old. If you want to look and feel young, I would date Larry King. That's what I'd do. I'd date, I'm feeling really hot next to Larry King. Maureen, where'd you get the dead guy? Um, see, I don't need some young hot guy named Chad coming up to me with his tight abs, touching my belly fat. I got belly fat, touching my belly fat going, oh, what's this? What, what's this, you little piece of crap? I'll tell you what this is. This is pain, pain covered by affordable treats and wine from Trader Joe's. That's what this is. That's what this is. By the way, wine sales are up. I don't deserve all the credit. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, I guess, you know, I judge people. I like judging people. It gives me hours of pleasure and I'm never going to stop. I used to want to be a better person, but I found it exhausting. And people will say to me all the time, they'll say Maureen, because that is my name. They'll say Maureen, you should never judge another person until you have walked a mile in their shoes. Let me tell all of you here something. I am the daughter of a New York City garbage man. I have walked in other people's shoes. Oh, you guys, listen, thank you for having me here tonight. I hope you'll follow me on Hanging with Langan. Um, it's where comedy meets connection and curiosity and we interview great people and we support our communities and I just wish everybody good health and just be kind and, and just generous to each other. Thank you so much. Oh, Maureen, that was terrific. I know, I'm kidding, bye wig. <laughs> Thank so you. Insane. But we're having fun, right? Yeah. yeah. We're doing our best. All right, you guys. All the best. Mwah. Bye, Wig. Mwah. Ah, beautiful. Uh -huh. Wonderful. Thank you, Maureen. Thank was, you, Steph. Yeah. You're such a funny lady. You always make me laugh. You always make me laugh. You're so fabulous. And uh, she actually did a one man show, a uh, one person show. Excuse me. Uh, was called a daughter of a garbage man. And quite funny. She's a very funny person. Please get a chance. Listen to the hanging with Langan, because it's quite funny. Um, your next comedian, ladies and gentlemen, your big closer for the evening. Uh, he's been a national headlining act for over thirty years. Crime any sex. He's okay. He's an old guy. Uh, he's appeared on NBC, ABC, Fox, Comedy Central, A&E, and remember VH1? Gosh, those are real channels on a real television. For those of you who remember what televisions are, yeah, it, unless you're watching the streaming things, but he's done that as well. He's also opened for such celebrities as Jerry Seinfeld, Jay Leno, Ringo Starr, what? Natalie Cole. Hall and Oates, both of them together, Vince Gill, uh, Chicago, the band, not the city, 
ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I've known this man for almost half my life. Here he is for you tonight, Mr. Dan St. Paul. Hello. Hello, can you all hear me? Oh, excellent. Very good. Nice to be here with all of you uh, technological ethicists or ethical technologists, whichever one you choose. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I have been doing comedy a long time. It's taken me this long to finally get a gig in my office. And, uh, and now I, I have one and I'm super excited. Even though I have the, the fake background, uh, there, there kind of gives you the comedy club essence. Um, before I begin, I must let you know that two days ago I was riding my bike and I fell and I cracked four ribs. So I'm talking to you with four cracked ribs tonight. So if I run out of breath or something, you know, I, I called the doctor and uh, they, she said, okay, go down and get an x-ray. So I went down and I got an x-ray and, uh, and she said, you've got four cracked ribs. And I said, well, is a distended stomach also a side effect of cracking your ribs? And she said, no, I think you're just overweight. And I just said, that's, you know, you've made me feel better already. And uh, I don't need any Norco or anything. Just keep being funny. But uh, I, uh, I'm nervous because this is the first time I've worn a long sleeve shirt in six months. And um, uh, my gym is closed. Uh, and, uh, and I've been doing uh, uh, aqua aerobics in my bathtub. And you can't see it right now, but my ankles are ripped. Um, I mean, a lot of people are not uh, working because of COVID, and it's sad, it's too, but there are people who are still working who shouldn't be working, and I'm talking about the traffic reporters on the radio. Why are they, how do they still have a gig, you know? I mean, I'm listening to it, and, and KGO, and they said, there's a, there seems to be a backup on the corner of uh, Millbury Avenue and El Camino Real, about nine cars deep. Oh, wait a minute. The light turned green. Everything's clear now. Back down to you. So I I just don't get it. But uh, I did shave. I did shave for everybody tonight. I shave because when you don't shave for a few days and you're 35, you look macho, you look sexy. But when you don't shave for a few days and you're 65, you look like an unregistered sex offender. And uh it's all my fault. I, I still have to register, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to watch uh, my behavior these days. I'm not riding the bike anymore, at least for a while. You know, I'm uh, I have to maintain my health. Uh, I, uh, I and, and my my mental health, because I don't want to be, you know, I don't want my obituary to read mildly successful comedian found dead on toilet playing Candy Crush. You know, that's not the person I want to be. And I don't get up until I reach the next level. So that could very well easily happen. Um, I, I know I know that I've noticed that people my age and older are losing their filter. I did a show in Florida uh, a while back and uh, Florida uh, is a, a little different. Uh, they don't use Uber. They call an ambulance just in case. And um, uh, after the show, this woman comes up to me and she goes, oh, you were so funny. I couldn't believe it when you said you were 65. I said to my friend, he doesn't look 65. But now that I see you up close, you kind of do. And uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a boomer, right? I'm a, I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 1950. Well, I'm 68 now. So I was born in 1952. And uh, uh, there's uh, a, a lot of us that are, are still out there. Uh, in fact, my wife and I went to go see ELO. Do you know who ELO is? Electric Light Orchestra. They were at, at the Oracle in Oakland. And so uh, this was last summer. My wife and I went and uh, we took BART. And the entire car was all baby boomers going to the show, except for two teenagers who had to be thinking is the rest home on a field trip. And uh, we get to uh, the station 
and, and then emptying out is this parade of guys in cargo pants and women in jeans that are way too tight. And, and, and one guy was actually wearing his original uh, ELO concert t-shirt and he had gotten so large that the O was just a straight line. And uh, we get to the, to the uh, arena and uh, we walk in and there were representatives from uh, Alta Bates Hospital uh, giving out uh, coupons, buy one stent, get one free. And um, we, uh, I noticed there was another band playing and it wasn't ELO. And I actually said this out loud. I go, oh no, there's an opener. We'll never get home in a decent hour. And uh, <laughs> they played for a half an hour. And, and they, after a half hour, they go, we're going to do two more songs. And, and 14,000 people in unison go, no, stop now. Uh, except for the woman behind me who screamed out, some people have aqua aerobics in the morning. Uh, so it was, uh, they do have people who will help you find your car at the end of the show, young people, which I thought was a nice touch. And uh, when they know it's an older crowd, each row has its own defibrillator, which is also nice, nice to see. Uh, but th this is uh, my life now. This is what's what's happening to me. I, I'm I'm in the, in the throes of getting older. There's certain signs, like uh, I I I have to sit down now to put on my pants. It's either that or get a spotter. And um, I'm uh, I have ten pair of reading glasses at home, and I have no idea where they are. Um, <sighs> Uh, I put a cup of coffee in the microwave to warm it up. When it was ready, it went ding, and I opened the refrigerator door. And these are just normal things that happen to me day after day. It's, 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 it, it's hard. You know, it's really tough. I bought a pair. I found a pair of skinny jeans in my closet, and I realized that I had bought them 20 years ago. Back then, they were called loose fit. And... Um, uh, I guess, you know, I can get in the movies for three bucks less, but I have to pee halfway through and that's just not, not fun. Uh, I guess the, the, the most alarming thing is that I, I take my dog for a walk. Uh, he poops twice and I am jealous. So that's something that, uh, is, is kind of, is kind of tough. Um, you know, it's, it's not just the baby boomers who are getting up there though. Generation X is 54 years old now. And I don't know if you realize that the, uh, the punk rockers are getting up there. Just the other day, I saw a guy wearing a, a Mohawk toupee, Joe. And uh, yeah, and he had a, a tight black jeans, size 46 waistline and uh, combat boots with Velcro straps. It, it's, it's weird, you know. I'll tell you what was really alarming. I saw a woman on TV who was 61 years old and she was dressed exactly like Madonna. And the really sad part about it was it was Madonna. So, uh, um, you know, there's these certain signs that are happening. I will not, uh, I will not do weird things to myself. I will not have plastic surgery or color my hair or any of those things. I, uh, I think it's a slippery slope. First of all, you sound stupid if you're trying not to act your age. I got a friend of mine who's my age he still thinks he's 25. He calls me up. Hey, damn, we got to go to this new bar, man. It's really happening. I said, dude, I'm 65. I've happened. If, if I'm going to go where I have to yell to be heard, I'll just not do the dishes, leave the bed unmade, and wait for my wife to come home. Um, and, and you look stupid, too. He's lost most of his hair, so he's spray painting his head. He bought this stuff called GLH, Great Looking Hair. It should be called SIC soot in a can. That's what it is. You spray it on whatever hair you have. It gloms onto it to make it look thicker. He has, I'm thinking, maybe three good hairs. Uh, now they each have to support 10 pounds of black Christmas tree flocking. And he's totally in denial. You know, I'm not really losing my hair. I just got a bald spot. I said, dude, you're bald. What you have is a hair spot. And... Um, you know, uh, I, I think instead of trying to uh, make people believe that you're younger than you are, you should just uh, sit back and enjoy everything that you've done. And that'll make you feel better. You know, uh, just this uh, 
uh, last year, my wife and I uh, celebrated uh, 32 years of marriage. Uh, yeah, I, I celebrated 32 years of marriage, uh, four incredible women, and um, she was just the last one. Uh, but no, we, we've been together for 32 years, and we're molding into the same person. In fact, all four of our breasts are now beginning to sag at the same time. And it's a wonderful thing, you know, to share those moments together as you get older great memories. Um, I usually have a way I, I figure out if I'm still in shape, I get out of the shower and I look down. And if my stomach is sticking out farther than my chest, I feel like I'm still in pretty good shape. But as I said earlier, my stomach is now starting to catch up. So I'm going to have to, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to go ahead and bite the bullet. I'm going to have to get breast implants. And uh, uh uh, technologically, I live in Foster City, which you probably know is a suburb of uh, Oracle. And uh, people ask me, is that in Silicon Valley? I say, I think so, because my neighbor has a four-year-old daughter with a lemonade stand that has a cloud-based customer relations management software solution. And she just tried to hostily take over the girl's stand down the street. Uh, so uh, I, I, I enjoy technology and this is gonna be surprising to you, but the most, the thing that I still like the best on the internet is Craigslist. I know it's been around forever, but Craigslist is the best because you can get rid of stuff that you have in your house on Craigslist that you, can't, that you would have to pay to get rid of otherwise. You know, uh, if I'm not doing nothing on a Tuesday, I'll, under free stuff, I'll, I'll post for fun like, uh, Laser printer plus urine stain mattress must take both. And uh, people will come over, hi, I'm here for the printer. And I'll go, and, and, uh, and they'll take it. They'll, they'll take it. They're, they're. And the other thing is uh, amazing to me is that I don't live that far from Google headquarters. And Google, probably the most recognized word in the world, actually, right now. And it's, I don't know, 15 minutes from my house, you know. I was just thinking, imagine if Google were developed somewhere else. Let's say, I don't know, New Jersey. Your search results would be totally different. You type in, uh, where's the best place to buy an iPad? Pier 12, midnight, bring cash. You know, it would be totally, totally different. But I, I think I blabbed on for over 10 minutes. Am I right, Deb? If you want more, I'll give you more. But thank you, Vahid. Uh, Vahid's giving me the okay sign. I can go over and stand. Go and sit down at the desk and then we'll talk. So uh thank you. Thanks everybody. You bet. <laughs> thanks so much, Dan. Sure. <laughs> sure. Nice to see everybody. Nice to see Joe, you. Joe, Maureen. Yeah, it's great to see you. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're talking over e each other so much, it's like the presidential debates. Oh, <laughs> it's kind of oh, like that. God. Yeah, will you shut up, man? <laughs> Can you imagine what that's going to be like with the, the, the town hall, you know, with actually uh, just rando people asking him questions? They should just do it on Zoom like we just did. They should. <laughs> yeah. The solution is there. Let's it use is. It is. Why don't we use the technology? It's, it's yeah. There. Well, instead yeah. of turning off the microphone, I think maybe a, an air Mute. blow dryer. An air horn. An yeah. air horn or a blow dryer. Every time blow dryer. it interrupts, just right and ruin his hair. Oh. You know how uh, long that lasts? I don't know. $75,000 hair. Yeah, I know. Exactly. exactly really. Right. I mean, uh, amazing. Oh, man. Because, I mean, and I, you know, Joe, Joe was a little harsh at times, but I thought it was totally called for. Uh, <laughs> I, I think he was speaking for every man when he said, would you just shut up? Oh, Joe, what do you mean? I don't this chip. I'm like, what? Yeah. yeah you you know? kind of, he was too hard. I think he was just like, eh. but you know, if they have, you don't want to muzzle people. You want them to, you don't want censorship, but if right. they have some structure where it is, you get to, like they did in the primaries, you get to respond for 45 seconds or two minutes. And then if they don't, if they don't respect the five second, 10 second over rule, then you know, your mic is cut. Right. Because, but then he's going to stalk like he did Hillary. He's just going to go back behind somebody and spew stuff from there. <laughs> I, then, I bet you this. Let me, yeah. let, let me jump in here. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, Sorry. And, and this is your party after all. <laughs> a word of disclaimer. Ethics in Tech is a 501c3, so we cannot condone or support any political candidates. Absolutely. No, you don't. You don't. 
is encourage people to get out there and vote. Absolutely. Exercise their constitutional right, regardless of who you believe in. Make sure your vote is counted and it's sent in via mail or dropped off. And what we care about is you guys getting out there and voting. I want to end tonight with a couple of things. First, I talked a lot about technology companies such as Amazon. Boris talked about Google and the lack of culture in these places. Silicon Valley is getting worse. It's not getting better. Um, it's unfortunately the needs of a few billionaires and uh, the way they run their company is not providing the kind of dignity and respect that employees need. Right. Um, we, if you look at these companies, the best thing that we could ask for, and I'm not saying I'm going to boycott Amazon and not give them my cat litter business, because I swear to God, that's the only place I order cat litter from is Amazon, just because they can carry the weight. Yeah. They should be broken up into smaller pieces, just mm -hmm. like Standard Oil was broken up. Mm -hmm. Google needs to be broken up. Facebook, Microsoft, they're all monopolies. And it's about time that they face regulators and they face the Congress and they answered for their actions and their business practices. Right. They no longer compete in Silicon Valley because of the big players that are in it. And right. that needs to stop. And we need to demand from our politicians to do more to watch over these companies. Right. Unfortunately, the kind of politicians we have, <laughs> there's not a lot they can watch over. They can't even act as uh, kindergartners among themselves. So it's not the politicians that are funded by Citizen United of the world. It is the system that puts in place the Jeff Bezos of the world, right. the Gates of the world. That system is fundamentally corrupt. It provides brute force capitalism for the masses and yep. socialism for the corporate welfare right. of these companies. And that's right. what needs to stop. So with, um, with a huge thanks to the comedians tonight, I want to share one last thing. We have an event planned for December 10th. December 10th is Human Rights Day. Uh, we are focusing it on empowering women in the tech sector and how they can advance in a male-dominated uh, industry. Uh, we have arranged for a number of speakers and comedians. It's a longer program. We'll post the exact time for each presenter and send that out to you so you can chime in when you want to hear whoever is speaking and chime out. But the United Nations designated December 10th as Human Rights Day. Tara Abrams and I are going to be uh, co-hosting the event, as well as Debbie Durst with the comedians. Um, if you want to see a lineup of who's going to be speaking, please take a look at this event from the ACLU to folks that work with Restore the Fourth to uh, people that are concerned with security and uh, the, uh, a variety of speakers. And of course, uh, of course, you guys all know Zahra Nurbakhsh. She was an award-winning comedian and a writer. Uh, her podcast is Good Muslim, Bad Muslim. Mm -hmm. She was just on uh, United Shades of America with Kamu Bal. And uh, she's going to be one of the comedians. Annette Mullaney is another. Of course, Debbie Durst and Diane Amos. So uh, right. it's going to be a, a fun night. We hope you guys can all make it. Um, thank you for all the support to Ethics and Tech. We wouldn't be able to do this without your donations. Uh, believe me, after the event we had tonight, nobody's going to hire me in Silicon Valley. So uh -huh. <laughs> send some donations so we can always cover some of our costs with video broadcasting, promotions, and getting our comedians uh, a thank you uh, payment uh, for their work. Of course, we're not compensating anybody as much as they deserve or uh, the work that they do, unfortunately, but uh, it's an honorarium for their participation and we're grateful for it. So with that said, I want to wrap up tonight's event. I want to thank Debbie and all the comedians, all the speakers, Bob, Boris, Reverend Allen. Thank you for making this night happen. Please consider coming and joining us on uh, 
December 10th for another night of ethics and tech, all focused on human rights and empowering women. So um, thank you so much all. Uh, have a wonderful evening and please vote. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thank you for everyone. Thank you, Debbie, for having us. Thanks, uh, Debbie. Thank you, for I want to say it right. I'm sorry. But thanks for having fun with me. Thanks, Joe. Good to see you guys, Dan. Good to see you guys. Good thanks to see you, everybody. everybody. Bye. 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 Take care. Thanks for